Someone pinch me right now because I don't believe this is real life. I'm not even joking. <laughs> oh, you don't realize what this probably is the greatest honor of my life to speak to you tonight on this stage in this church uh, because I don't know if you know it or not, but we have one of the greatest churches in the entire world. And not only that, but we have some of the greatest pastors and leaders and staff members in the entire world. Come on. Come on, you can do better than that. Give it up for your leaders, man. They are awesome. And I'm telling you, we have great things in future for us. We truly are bringing all people into the life, the family, and the purpose of God. We have a global impact around the world. This is a house of legacy and integrity. And I'm telling you, God's fixing to elevate it in a way it never has been before. Come on, do you believe that? I wholeheartedly believe that. So if I'm sitting in your shoes tonight, if I was sitting in your seat, there would be a couple of things that would be running through my mind. Number one is, who is this guy? And what have they done with Pastor Larry? (laughs) And Pastor Larry will be back with us next first Wednesday, and it's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss that. He did help me prepare this message, thank God. So I promise you it won't be that bad. He did help me. And as far as who I am, I'm just a guy who 10 years ago decided to move from his home and come to a program called 220i Internship. Yeah. I moved to Baton Rouge and and came here to this church, and I was, man, I was just schooled in radical discipleship, radical prayer, and radical evangelism, and my life was forever changed. Long story short, 10 years later, and here I am today, speaking to you, and I actually work with Bethany College, 220i has turned. Yeah, come on, Bethany College. Give it up. Listen, if you are a student, and if you're a parent of a student, and y'all are starting to think about college, you need to start thinking about Bethany College. Yeah, that's right. Your life will be changed, and uh, hey, you never know what really cool opportunities in the future it might open up for you. Amen? All right, well, we're going to dive into it tonight, if that's all right. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, and uh, I do think there is a basketball game on tonight. I do realize that, the NBA playoffs, and uh, I'm going to try to get you home for that. No, I promise I'll get you home, and uh, I'm not a prophet, but I can already tell you who's going to win, so uh, it's over. Go ahead and put a ring on KD and Steph's finger again. Okay, I'll move on. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, it says this, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I just pray tonight that through your word you would open up our eyes to the realities of the things of heaven. Lord, we thank you for your presence that was here with us. Lord, we specifically pray tonight, I specifically pray for those watching in Baker, those in Homa, Lord, that they would feel your presence so strong tonight. We pray for those watching online that you would bless them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So when I got the text and it said, hey, will you speak on First Wednesday? At first, I thought it was a joke. I was like, me? Really? You want me to speak? And I was like, I was blown away. I was like, absolutely, yes, I will speak. What an honor. And then I learned what the topic was. The topic, we want you to speak on angels. So I was like, all right, angels. (laughs) You know, first time speaking, just throw me in the deep end. We're going for it. We're going for angels. You know, and I just begin to think in my mind, like, what do I know about angels? Like, seriously, what do I know about angels? And I promise you, I studied for this message, so I have learned something. But, you know, I grew up in the 90s. Come on, I'm a 90s kid. So I loved a movie back in the day called Angels in the Outfield. Come on, anybody remember that one? This was it right here. This was the sign. Uh, You know, I watched a few episodes with my grandmother of Touched by an Angel. Come on, we remember that. (laughs) As I begin to think about tonight, I was like, you know, God, I just need like, I've never seen an angel. I believe in them. Maybe just, God, could you let me see an angel so I could have a really good story to tell your people? Even if maybe just the wing of an angel, Lord, let me see. Let me just wake up with a feather on my pillow. Give me something, God. 
I want to tell these people about angels. And, you know, the more I begin to think on it, I begin to realize I don't know that I've ever really heard a message in church on angels. And to be honest, I don't know in the modern church era that we're in that a lot of people speak about it or even speak about the supernatural world in general. And aren't you glad to go to a church? We are taking a whole year to talk about the supernatural world of God. Yeah. We're not ignoring it because we know it's real. But here's where the church has to be careful. We can't let the mindset of the world, the modern Western mindset, permeate the church. And here's what the modern Western mindset says, that you cannot have faith, and science at the same time, that they can't coexist together. The modern world tells us today that if you can't see it with your eyes, if there's not empirical evidence, hard data, then it doesn't exist. It's just a fairy tale. It's just a myth. It's just folklore. See, the modern world, the modern Western world wants to eliminate all mysteries in the universe. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to ignore the mysteries of our own faith. We'll begin to only talk about natural things and never talk about supernatural things. But that verse that I just read earlier said, yes, God made the earth, but he also made the heavens. Yes, God made the visible, but he also made the invisible. And there's a whole nother world that has rulers and powers and principalities and angels and demons. And it exists and it's real. And we're going there one day. He's put eternity in our hearts. We were made for that world. We were made for mystery. And we can't ignore it. Just because you can't fully explain it, just because you can't fully understand it, doesn't mean that you should ignore it. I want you to realize tonight, our faith, what we believe, has, it's founded on mysteries. Listen, you can't even talk about God before you've got a mystery on your hands. How? The doctrine of the Trinity, we serve one God, but yet he's three in one. That's a mystery. I can't fully explain that to you tonight. Jesus is 100% man, but he's also 100% God. That's a mystery. I can't explain that fully to you tonight. But just because the ocean is deep and I can never swim to it to the bottom by myself doesn't mean I should stay on the shore my whole life. At some point, I got to get off the shore and get in the water and just go for it. So we're going to dive in tonight to the supernatural world. Is that all right with you? Yeah, because we can't ignore it. The Bible, 297 times the Bible talks about angels. Yeah, Old Testament, New Testament, filled with these beings called angels. So we can't ignore it. We're going to dive into it. Let's just go. Hey, look, I got seven attributes, okay? Seven. So stick with me. I know that's a lot. Seven point message, but we're going to roll right on through. And I think God is just going to bless us and encourage our faith tonight. So number one, angels are messengers. Angels are messengers. That's your first blank there. I want to teach you a Hebrew word for angel. And this is it. Ready? It's malach. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Say it with me. Say it. Try it. Malach. Someone in Homa, come on, try it with me. Ha- malach. Yeah, that's right. See, you guys know Hebrew. You guys are smart. You probably need to apologize to the person sitting in front of you because you spit all over the back of their neck. That's the Hebrew word for angels. The Greek word is angelos, angelos. And they both mean the same thing. They mean messenger or ambassador of God. And at the heart of what an angel is, They are messengers for God, much like you and I are messengers for God. And believe it or not, a lot of what we have in the scriptures come to us from angels. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2, it tells us that Moses actually received the law on Mount Sinai, but it came from angels. It was declared by angels, and angels come bringing a message, but they're not just bringing their message. They're bringing to us the message of the Lord. It's not their own. It's God's message. At the, at the root of that Hebrew word, it means this, one who is dispatched as a deputy. That's what angels are. They're deputies for God. They stand in the presence of God. They wait for a message from God, and then they bring to us the message of God and declare that message. We see this in Luke chapter 1. We have Gabriel 
Look, there's two archangels mentioned in the Bible. One's Gabriel, one's Michael. Uh, the other angel that's mentioned in the Bible is Lucifer, but we ain't going there tonight. We stand away from old Lucy tonight. So, <laughs> This is what it says in Luke 1, 19 through 20. It says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. So you see, Gabriel stands in the presence of God, and he brings God's word. Angels bring us God's words. Josephus who was a historian during Jesus' day. You know, he got made fun of a lot in school. If your name is Josephus, probably got made fun of a lot of. He says this, We have learned the noblest of our doctrines and the holiest of our laws from the angels sent by God. Here's my point. This word right here is not a natural word. This word right here is a supernatural word. And it came from a different world. It didn't come from our world. This isn't a man-made ideology, but this is a word that came from God, sent to us by his messengers, by his angels. So we need to read this word. We need to get in this word like never before, because when you take it, you are literally eating the manna of heaven. It's feeding your soul spiritually. And this is, oh, this is one way angels serve us. They minister to us and have ministered to us by bringing us the word of God. Number two, angels are ministers. Angels are ministers. Hebrews 1.14 says this. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? I don't know if you caught what that scripture is saying or not. But it's saying that mighty, powerful angels that live in a realm that we don't live in and they're in the very presence of God, that one of the reasons they exist is to serve you, is to minister to you. That speaks something to me. First of all, it tells me, Chad, there is nobody beneath you that you can't serve. Because if almighty angels can serve you, your finite self, then you can serve somebody else too. Angels minister to us, and one of the greatest examples of angels ministering to us is in the life of Jesus. In two different situations, we see where angels come and they minister to Jesus. Once when he's in the wilderness and he's being tempted by Satan. And another time when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me read that to you real quick. Mark 1.13 says, And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. And Luke 22.43 says, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him while he was in the garden. Well, we need to realize tonight that these were two moments in Jesus' life where he was really experiencing the humanity side of what he took on. These were vulnerable moments for Jesus when he was here. Number one, he hadn't eaten in 40 days. Listen, if I haven't eaten in 40 minutes, I'm feeling it. You know what I'm saying? I'm feeling he hadn't eaten in 40 days. And on top of that, he was fighting against Satan himself. And then in the other setting in the Garden of Gethsemane, the weight of the world was literally on his shoulders. The anxiety, the pressure that was on his shoulders. And in these moments when he was all alone, in these moments when nobody else was around, these are the moments when angels came and ministered to him. And I think there's some people here tonight that maybe you feel like you're in a season where you're all alone. You feel the pressure or the weight of the world on you. You feel the pressure in your job. You feel the pressure in your family. Or maybe you feel like your family has been fighting the devil himself. I'm here to bring a word of encouragement to you tonight and say there is a whole host of heaven's angels that are here for you to serve you and encourage you and minister to you. Amen. Come on. Can we give the Lord praise for that tonight? Number three, angels are providers. Angels are providers. I'm not going to lie. This is probably my favorite one. I love this one. Angels providing materially for God's people. And you might say, like, why does God, why does he need to use angels? He's God. And you're right. He is God. He doesn't need to use angels. But I could ask the question, why does God need to use you? He's God. He doesn't need angels and he doesn't need us, but he created us and God loves to partner with his creation. 
He partners with us. He partners with angels to further his purpose in the earth. And one of the ways he does that is angels being providers. I love this story in 1 Kings when Elijah, the prophet, is on the run from a woman named Jezebel. Come on. Say that with me. Say Jezebel. Yeah, we all know. <laughs> if you've been in church long enough, you've heard that name. You know, oh, yeah, that's a Jezebel right there. You know, you've heard that. <laughs> you've been in church long enough. Well, Jezebel was... She was, she was a bad woman, all right? And she was chasing after Elijah, and Elijah's running from her, and Elijah told God, God, I want to die. Like, I'm done. I'm done with this prophet thing. I'm ready to go. I feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do. And he falls asleep, and in 1 Kings 19, 5 through 6, it says this, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down. Now, I don't know about you, but if I ever do get to experience a moment with an angel, this is the kind I want right here. <laughs> I, I want to wake up and there'd be an angel, and he doesn't say, uh, man, you got to run for your life. It's getting bad out here. Or tell me some doom and gloom about the end of the world. I want the angel to wake up and say, Chad, get up, man. I've been baking all morning. I got, <laughs> I got some angel food cake for you. You've been, <laughs> recipes, been in the family for like a million years. It's really good. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm glad you guys are a good crowd. That was kind of a corny joke. But <laughs> See, if you keep reading, this actually happens again. Uh, Elijah falls back asleep, and then the angel wakes him up again, makes more food for him, and then sends him on his way. And the Bible says that Elijah didn't eat again on his journey for another 40 days. See, this is supernatural provision that comes from God to angels to us. You know, Billy Graham tells a story about a time when he went and visited some Marines who had been in the Korean War. And these Marines had been trapped in a certain area up north for six days, and the temperature was negative 20 degrees. Yeah, negative 20 degrees, and they hadn't eaten anything. And one of the guys was a believer, so he found a scripture, just believing God will provide. He taught all the other Marines a song. What did they have to lose, you know? <laughs> so they read the scripture, he prayed, they sang a song, and the story is as they're getting done, they hear a loud crash and they think someone's invading their camp, but they look up and a wild boar is running right through the camp. And so they all run, but then a guy thinks, wait, bacon, you know what I'm saying? So he pulls up his rifle to shoot and before he even gets a shot off, the boar falls down dead right there in the camp. He didn't even, he didn't even need to be shot. And that night they had some barbecue, amen. <laughs> amen, listen, I believe with all my heart that our God will provide for you. That it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're at. You could be running from Jezebel or be up in North Korea somewhere. Our God can find you wherever you're at and provide for you in that moment. I believe it. I, wanna, I just want to build your faith tonight. I was, I, there was a, I was praying with a lady yesterday. She didn't have a job. She got laid off her job and she needed a job. We prayed and guess what? Today she has a job. God will provide. I'm telling you. I think we need to move on to the next point. I don't know if I'm building your faith or making you hungry. So we got to get on. Number four, angels are watchers. Angels are watchers. You know, the world we live in today Really, someone's always watching. Yeah, yeah, it's not like it used to be. Someone's always got a camera phone somewhere, right? Someone's always. The best bet is you just need to stay holy wherever you go, all right? Don't just be holy as the Lord is holy everywhere you go, on the road, in the mall, because someone's watching. They got a video camera now. It's really good quality. <laughs> someone's always watching. I don't know if this, is, this has happened to you, but a couple of times... I've been just talking with people now, just talking with them about like a certain product. One was a ring. I was interested in like changing my wedding, wedding ring and going to a different brand. I was talking with a friend about it and I didn't Google it. I didn't do any of that. 
I pick up my phone, I open up Facebook, and guess what the first ad is right there? Someone explain that one to me, come on. <laughs> they're listening, they're watching. This has happened to me twice now, I, and I, I'm not going and Googling it. So listen, we live in a world where someone's always watching. And, uh, but to be honest, someone always has been watching. The, the Lord's angels are watchers. That's what they do. I want to put up the picture of the Ark of the Covenant, if you can. Yeah. In the Old Testament, we all know, I mean, we know that the Ark of the Covenant was God's symbol of his presence on the earth, right? And two things happen on top, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the mercy seat. Okay. Two things happened at the mercy seat. One thing that happened is that the priest, one time of year, would bring blood and sprinkle it right there for redemption. It would wash away, it would purify the sin of the nation of Israel for an entire year. That's one thing that happened. The other thing that happened is in Exodus 25, 22, and it says this, I will speak with you all that I will give you commandments for the people of Israel above from the mercy seat. God said, I'm going to speak to you, Moses, from the mercy seat. Two things happened, the sprinkling of blood and God spoke from the mercy seat. Well, if you put that picture back up there, you notice that above the mercy seat are two angels. They're cherubim and they have their wings spread out over their head. But if their eyes were looking right at the mercy seat, they were eternally watching two things. They're watching over God's word and they're watching over God's redemption. Those two things they are always watching over. And inside of the ark is God's written word, the Ten Commandments. On top of the ark was God's spoken word, his revelation, his rhema word. And the angels watch over both of them. They watch over his word that's been spoken throughout the earth. That means we have angels watching our cities. There's angels watching over our cities and seeing if the commands of God are being fulfilled in the earth. We see this in, in Genesis 19.1, that two angels were watching over Sodom when Lot came to the gate. They're there and they're watching. And listen, sometimes God will send angels to judge a city for the wickedness. Listen, it happens. They're watching and sin and wickedness are offense to the glory of God and it's offense to his angels. You know, God, God's not afraid to send, I don't want to be that guy, but hey, judgment does happen, all right? I better move on from that because we're just going to be happy tonight in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. So whether you know it or not, there's always someone watching. There's a cloud of great witnesses, right? And they're in another world, and I believe they can see in our world. And they're watching everything we do. But what I love about it is that the, the angels of God are also watching over his redeemed. They're guarding us tonight. Watching over God's words in our life. Watching over what we're doing. And that's our next point. Angels are guardians. Angels are guardians. Psalm 91, verse 11. Don't you love this scripture? This is one of the best ones, man. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent will trample, you will trample underfoot. We see many times God's protection for his people. In the lion's den, Daniel said, God's angel came and shut the mouth of the lion. Paul was on a ship and, the, and an angel appeared to him and said, hey man, this ship is going down. It's going to wreck, but everybody on this boat is going to be okay. I, I am guarding over this. I heard a, a story of a missionary, a lady named Miss Munson, who was a missionary in China, and she had a, a compound where she was helping women and children refugees in China. And her town that she was in, this particular town, it had come under attack from like bandits. They would come at night and they would rob and loot certain places. Well, Miss Munson, she stayed up all night one night and she was just so worried. She said, God, I have been telling these children, I have been telling these people that you protect us and you guard us. And she just basically said, please don't make me a liar. <laughs> That's what she said. And the next morning she woke up 
And her neighbor said, hey, who are those four guys sitting on top of your house last night watching it all night? <laughs> he said, she said, what are you talking about? There was no guys here. They're like, we're not crazy. We saw four men. They didn't sleep all night. They stood and they watched guard over this compound all night. And it hit her. And she said, oh, I prayed. <laughs> and God is guarding us. I want to tell a story of a, a personal friend of mine. Uh, back home, we have, uh, there's a, a curve. It's called Dead Man's Curve. Self-explanatory, right? <laughs> so it's, it's raining one night. And my friend is in a car. He's in the, in the passenger seat. It's raining. He goes off the road. And he hits a tree. Can you, can you put that picture of the car up, the first one, please? Yeah, this was his car that hit a tree. He's in the passenger seat. And uh, go to the next one. So it, he's six foot two, all right? That's long legs. The engine went up into the passenger seat. At this point in my friend's life, he is not saved, but he's got a praying mama. Come on, somebody. He is not saved. And these are the words that came out of his mouth. I don't know what happened. All I know is I saw a hand come and unbuckle my safety belt. I don't know what happened after that, but all, I, all that came out of it was some broken pair of glasses. Come on. His legs should have been crushed. Come on, come on, somebody. Give some praise to the Lord tonight because he's watching over us. I believe it. This stuff is real, man. <laughs> the angels guard us. Now, Satan doesn't guard us. He attacks us. And one of the ways he attacks us is through slander. He slanders our name before the Father. But not only that, he slanders the Father's name before us. He tries to tell us, like he told Eve, is God really good? Did God really say that? God's, he's holding out on you. He slanders the Father's name to us. And I, maybe there's some people here tonight, you've been dealing with fear so bad in your life. You've been dealing with fear. You can't sleep at night. You fear and you dread something that may happen to your children. And you just can't shake this fear. And it's the slanderer lying to the Father about you. And I want to tell you tonight that there are angels who are there to guard you. And all of heaven is behind you. And we serve a God who doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. Our help comes from him. All of heaven's armies are behind us. This is our sixth point. Angels are warriors. Here we go. Come on now. That's what you've been waiting on right there. Angels are warriors. Look, angels are bad dudes. All right? Somewhere in culture, I don't know where, we got angels, people think they look like little chubby babies on clouds somewhere <laughs> flown. Listen, that is not what angels look like. You read the Bible and you see most people that saw angels thought they were going to die. <laughs> they were scared to death. If you, most of the time when people say angels, the angel was always like, you know, hey, Fear not. It's okay. I'm here with good news. I'm here. I'm on your side. Angels are bad dudes. One angel struck down 185,000 Assyrians in one night. The death angel killed the firstborn of every family and herd in Egypt the night of the Passover. These are bad dudes. You know, Pastor Larry told me a story as we were preparing for this message uh, about Richard Roberts. Richard Roberts is Oral Roberts' son. And Oral Roberts told his son, if you're in the room when I pass, I believe you'll get a double portion of my anointing. So he was in the room. And right before his dad passed, he said, I saw it with my own eyes. He said, I was sitting in the room and all of a sudden there was a man that, whose head was touching the ceiling. And then there was another man whose head went through the ceiling. I could only see up to his shoulders because the rest of him was through the ceiling. And he was dressed in full military garb, full military regalia. And it wasn't long, just maybe an hour or two after that, Brother Roberts went on to be with the Lord. Listen, these, these angels, they're warriors. They're not soft. <laughs> and they're on your side. I love the story of Elisha. 
in 2 Kings when Elisha's servant goes outside and he sees an entire army that's surrounding the house where Elisha and his servant are at. And Elisha's kicked back in a recliner. He's just chilling, you know. And the servant comes and says, Elisha, there is an army outside. What are we going to do? And Elisha, he's just chill. He's like, man, there's more for us than are against us. Don't even worry about it. If I'm Elisha's servant, I'm like, I love you, man. I know you're a prophet. We got this whole prophet thing going on, but this is not the time to be super spiritual. This is the time to run. We need to go right now. But he prays and he says, Father, open up my servant's eyes. And he, the servant's eyes are open and he sees an army of angels and chariots of fire surrounding the army that was surrounding them. Come on, there is more for us than are against us. And I've heard it said before, new levels, new devils. And I believe that with all my heart. But when we go to a new level, God's also sending more angels to come and help us fight every devil from hell that comes at us. Come on, amen. I'm going to have to move on from that, all right? This is my last one. Angels are worshipers. Number seven. Angels are worshipers. And, you know, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Isaiah, we really get, uh, Isaiah 6, Revelation 4 and 5, we really get such a great picture of what's going on in heaven, even at this moment. It talks about two different types of angels, cherubim and seraphim that are before the throne. And these creatures, they're amazing They're like, if you were to see it, you would just be in awe. The description is, you know, one creature has the head of a a lion. One has the head of a man. One has the head of an eagle. One has uh, the head of an ox. And they have, some creatures have six wings and they have eyes all over their body. Just amazing, beautiful creatures. But the thing about the angels in heaven is this. They never are looking at their own beauty. Even though they're amazing themselves, every eye on their body is focused on the one who sits on the throne. And they cry out for all eternity. Come on. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Day and night, night and day, they never stop. I don't believe they're forced to do it. I believe they see so much of God. They see a new reflection of his glory every moment that all they can do is cry, holy, holy, holy. And what happens in Revelation is amazing. This is what happens, that the worship that's going on around the throne fuels the worship that's going on not around the throne or in the earth. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. The, the, the ones worshiping around the throne are representatives of different, okay? They're representative of different, uh, I would say, beings. You have angels and then you have 24 elders. They represent us, right? Um, and so what happens around the throne is amazing. You have five songs that are sung. I'm gonna do this really quick, all right? Five songs that are sung. The first song is sung by just the four living creatures around the throne. The second song is sung by the 24 elders. Well, the angels over here get so excited that worship is going on, and the 24 elders get so excited that worship is going on that they sing another song, and they sing it together this time. And then a fourth song happens, the 24 elders, the angels around the throne, and then thousands and thousands and thousands of other angels join in. And then there's a fifth song, the living creatures around the throne, the 24 elders, thousands and thousands of angels, and then everything that has breath on the earth, in the earth, under the earth, in the sea, begins to give praise to God. (laughs) Worship, listen, when we worship here, it fuels the worship there, and the worship there fuels us. And you know it when you're in the room and something has changed in the atmosphere. You know it. It's different. We were singing songs just a little bit ago, but something changed in this room. And it's the presence of God and it's the presence of angelic activity that's taking place because our worship is, it, it, it really is, we're fueling off one another. I know this is out there and this is deep, but I believe we can step into something that's not natural. It's supernatural. 
and that God's angels, man, they can come in this room tonight. If you need a word, they're messenger. If you need provision, they're providers. If you, man, they're watching over you tonight. They're guarding over you if you need protection. If you're in a fight for your life, they're warring angels that will fight on your behalf. All of heaven, that was when I was praying today. That's what I felt like one thing God wanted me to say. All of heaven's army is behind you tonight. Can we stand to our feet all over the room tonight and just, I want us to enter back into a moment of worship if that's all right. Come on, Baker and Homer, we just stand all over the room. And we're just going to worship the Lord. Come on, can we lift our hands all over the room tonight? Come on, let's join in with the angels. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. tonight. Just sing your own song to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let worship be in this place. Angels are descending upon this place. As we worship you, Jesus, all the earth replies, holy are you. I want to share one more scripture with you tonight. First Peter 1 Peter 1.12, it says this. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. We are interested in angels. We want to learn about them. We want to know about them. But I want to tell you tonight, angels are interested in you. They're looking into you tonight because you sing a song that they can't sing. Angels don't know what it's like to sing a song and be redeemed by God. Angels don't know what it's like to be forgiven and to have their sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. So they're looking at you tonight, and they want to know, what is this all about? And I believe there's people here tonight that you need to be saved. You need to, you've been away from God. You've been running away from God. And Baker and Homa, you're here tonight and you need to give your life to the Lord. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, and you need to be redeemed. You need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you're here tonight, I want you to very quickly, if you just put your, put your arm up, put your hand up. And let me see. If that's you tonight, thank you. Anyone else tonight? Thank you. I'm looking, I'm looking. Thank you. All right, I want us to pray this prayer together. Come on, we pray together out loud here. Let's believe. Say, Jesus, 
we believe in you, that you're the Son of God, and you came to die for my sin. I confess today that I am a sinner, and I need you. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness, and help me to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise tonight. The angels in heaven rejoice. Come on, with one sinner repents. Amen.